I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. We say necessity is the mother of invention, but false necessity is the mother of stupid inventions. There seems to be an unstoppable march toward the automation of work, from checkout at the supermarket to the seemingly limitless possibilities of chat GPT to much else. But Lamp Pritchett, a development economist, argues in a new piece for foreign affairs that none of this is inevitable. In fact, it reflects a policy failure that is needlessly driving up poverty across the globe. Instead of handing jobs over to robots, Pritchett argues, rich countries should lift the barriers to migration. Put simply, choosing devices over people is a mistake. Lant, thank you for doing this and for the powerful essay in our current issue. Thanks for inviting me. I think you're fairly unique among development economists in the focus you put on migration. What was your path to that focus? Tell me a bit about your path through development economics and how you came to see migration as so central to these questions. So it gradually dawned on me that in the design of development organizations at its foundations in the 1950s and 60s, we had a fundamentally wrong model of what was going to happen. The vision was once these countries were newly freed of colonial powers and could guide their own destiny, the existing economic model of the time is something called the Solo model, named after Bob Solo. It assumed that your level of output was factors and technology, but it assumed technology was these blueprints. So if you think about that model and you think blueprints are just in the air and going to diffuse very fast, then what was going to happen was technology was going to converge. So the production possibilities of these countries was going to get very high. And what was going to limit their output was the ability to accumulate both physical and human capital. So in that kind of thinking, this is the thinking behind the World Bank, because in that kind of thinking, what was going to constrain the rapid growth process that was going to lead to a variety of benefits, including poverty reduction, was really how fast economies could accumulate capital. Turns out that was completely, totally wrong. The crazy thing about the world is that the reason why incomes have failed to converge is because productivity hasn't converged. And so if you think of productivity as these technologies that are in there, like how to run a power plant and how to, you know, put fertilizer on crops, that's just bizarre, right? It's like, well, why didn't the technology converged? And it turns out what really determines countries' productivity isn't technology at all. <laughs> um, Haiti isn't poor because there aren't blueprints of how Haiti could build a power plant or a factory or grow crops better. It's the nature of the economy and the politics and the society and the history that interact to determine productivity. So Again, then the way in which development was designed, it was designed to augment the pace at which countries could invest in building more machines faster and educating people faster. And gradually through my research, so I didn't start off, as you say, I worked 30 years in development before I really came around to seeing the importance of migration because in the old model, you know, people should want to move to these high productivity places. But what was really driving the lack of development was this failure, not of capital to converge or not of education levels to converge, but what was driving the persistent differences in per capita incomes and hence in poverty was the lack of convergence of productivity. And when productivity doesn't converge, then the easiest way to make a poor person much, much richer is to move them from a low productivity place to a high productivity place. There's a, a really striking statistic in the piece about education levels in poor countries. And the statistic you cite notes that the massive expansion of education in the developing world since the 1950s, I'm quoting you here, means that the average adult in Haiti today has had more schooling than the average adult in France had in 1970. So we have had lots of focus on building, quote unquote, human capital in, in these places. But as you see it, that just hasn't had an effect on growth or development in a meaningful way. Exactly. Because in our model, we were thinking the technological stuff was there and we just needed to educate people to get to it. But I mean, 
you know, people in France thought they were a very advanced civilization in 1970. <laughs> but, you know, the average adult in Haiti, in Haiti today, has a higher level of years of schooling than people in France did in 1970, which is just, again, it's, I, I cite it all the time because even, even to me that I'm well acquainted with the countries and the statistics, it really blew my mind of how rapid the expansion of education has been. And, you know, one of my other research endeavors is around improving the quality of education. But in the end, the experiment of let's make people richer by putting them through more school is an experiment the world's done. You can't say we didn't try it. So, you know, often people say, well, why are you focused on migration instead of focusing on helping people be productive in their own country? And the answer is we are, or, you know, the development community has been doing a whole variety of things to try and help countries become more productive. It's not like, oh, we've ignored education or we've ignored economic growth. We try, we, the development community, have, have a, succeeded in vastly expanding education and have been trying to figure out how to make these countries rich. It just turns out it's really hard. It's much harder than taking a blueprint from Miami across the short bit of the water to Haiti and it will work. And so we've gotten stuck in these quite large productivity differentials, which just means moving a person from this low productivity place to this high productivity place, same productivity of the individual, their wages go up by a factor of five. Right. So you bring that Haitian uh, to Florida rather than sending the technology the other way, and you suddenly get that development benefit. You cite this other paper in the piece, another effort, other kind of anti-poverty program, another development program that transferred livestock to poor families. You know that this was a successful program that spent about $4,500 per person and had a benefit of about $350 in in annual household consumption, which is you know successful by the standards of these initiatives, but still fairly modest. But the takeaway for you, and I'm again going to quote the, the piece here, is that decades of well-intentioned development programs cannot equal the benefit of permitting a person in a poor country to work in a wealthier, more productive one. If they want to help the world's poor, citizens of rich countries should understand that all of the worthy development projects, anti-poverty programs, and foreign aid have an inconsequentially small effect compared with the benefit of just letting people move to the rich countries that need them and work for the going wage justified by their productivity. So that's the takeaway of these decades of work you've done on this. Give us a sense of, I mean, I think we have some intuitive feeling for why this is, but how exactly is that so powerful? How do you get those gains that so completely uh, outstrip what you get from development efforts focused on the countries themselves? The way you get the productivity gains is that there's just higher value productivity in a sophisticated economy. So, you know, a lot of the talk in development these days is about inclusive growth. Well, what inclusive growth should mean is we include people into a sophisticated value chain and we include people into a very sophisticated production process. So if you take someone and allow them to work in elder care in Miami, the value of that elder care is very high because it's part of a sophisticated elder care process. Whereas, you know, if they're just working, trying to scramble around in the informal economy, which is where most of the employment in poor countries these days is, they're not embedded in the sophisticated value chain. So one of the things we've learned about productivity is a lot of what makes productivity is people cooperating in very sophisticated ways. So one of the things is one of the reasons why people can, the same intrinsic productivity person can vastly increase their productivity is they move from a unsophisticated, difficult to create effective cooperation and sophisticated value chain economy to an economy in which they're a piece and a needed piece and a very sophisticated, high productivity endeavor. So one reason why productivity didn't converge is we've learned it's very hard to, to move the very sophisticated, complex cooperation modalities that make a sophisticated economy like the US or Germany or Japan. It's hard to move those because you have to move all the pieces. So moving a, a person to a place where all these pieces are already in place and the person can just slot in and be included in a high productivity economy, that's inclusive growth. Whereas trying to move all of the pieces that are needed to a low productivity place is very hard. And I'm all for doing it. 
countries like Vietnam have had really rapid growth as they have gotten their act together and created the possibilities of that. And so I'm not, I haven't given up on being a development economist. I still do research on what would enable countries to have economic growth, but we've learned that it's hard, much harder than we thought. One argument that you often hear in response to that kind of proposal is concerns about the effects on the the home countries, right? The sending countries for migrants, and that could be brain drain, though you have an outstanding line in the piece that the most uh, compelling thing about the idea of brain drain is the two words rhyme, which is a, a fairly devastating critique. But to take it a little bit more seriously, you know, so, some of this could be kind of societal, right? The effects of large scale migration can be troubling for people. Some of it could be economic. What do you make of the effects on sending countries on home countries? So I, I, I think what these effects are depend on who the rich countries allow to move. So a way a lot of countries have dealt with the need for more workers and the benefits against the politics of wanting to limit migration is they deliberately, it's a global war for talent. They deliberately select to allow to come to Canada or Australia the people who would, if they stayed in their own country, have the biggest impact. So to some extent, brain drain is built into selective immigration systems that are selecting on people with high skills. What I'm talking about is allowing people to move to do what I don't, I don't like to use the word low skill, what I call core skill jobs. And by a core skill job, I mean, you show up, you integrate yourself into the production process, you do the job you're told to do, but which really don't require large degrees of formal training. So these are core skill jobs. So the core skill jobs, like allowing people to come work in home health care and take care of the elderly in Miami, that's not causing brain drain because it's not the best and brightest of Haiti that are going to move to take those jobs. It's the people with average skill sets. So I do, in some sense, take seriously the, the challenge that if rich countries are left to their own devices, they'll kind of pursue their own best interests and say, well, it's, it's a global war for talent. We need the best software engineers from India. We need the bio. We need doctors. You know, what few doctors Africa creates, let's get them to move because we don't want to expand our own medical school. So, yes, the rich world has, in fact, been doing things almost by deliberate design to maximize brain drain. What I'm talking about is the opposite end of the skill spectrum. So I'm not at all concerned that if we opened up pathway, legal pathways for core skilled workers to move on a rotational basis, that that would cause brain drain. That doesn't cause brain drain. Existing policies are in some sense maximizing brain drain. And by rotational basis, you mean coming temporarily, working, and then going back home? Yeah. I mean, coming, working, or temporary where, and this gets, this is a very highly charged issue because we have this sense of what's fair and we don't want to violate people's sense of what's fair. And I think most people find it unfair to let someone come work in your country for 35 years. And then when they're done being a worker say, no, 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 you can't stay. You need to go back to your home country, which most of our ideas would have some path to citizenship through rotational, but it wouldn't be expected or immediate. So you would come on a a one year or a two year or a three year contract, you would be expected to return. You might return at a future date and engage in another contract. And maybe if you successfully did a series of those, you would, you know, acquire points towards some citizenship pool. But we would focus on the rotational because I think there's a large demand for it. Lots and lots of people would love the opportunity to work in the US or Germany, but don't want to move there. They don't want to be there permanently. And, you know, when you do interviews of youth, the fraction of youth who say they would like to move temporarily is often twice as high as those who say they would like to move permanently. So there's a huge pent up demand of people who say, look, no, no, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, you know, uh, people have strong reasons for often wanting to live where they were born and raised and where they understand the culture and it's their culture and they own the place. But at the same time would love to come and work, you know, one year, three year, five years, and maybe two, three year stints or whatever in a high productivity place that it would give them savings. It would provide them, you know, opportunities to uh, launch as adults in a much more propitious way than trying to scramble around in the current conditions. Is there any way to estimate 
what the gains in terms of growth and and anti-poverty would be if we had the level of migration that you think is warranted given the the differences in productivity? Is there any way to capture that? By our calculations for the first world to maintain its current ratio of workers to aged, by 2050, you're going to need 400 million foreign-born workers in the rich world. The total stock right now is from poor countries in the rich world is on the order of 150. So a massive expansion. Okay, let's say of that incremental 400 million, half of them come on path to citizenship and half of them come temporary. That's still 200 million people kind of on a rotational basis each year as a flow. (laughs) And you multiply that, we have quite good, rigorous estimates of the typical wage gain. And the typical wage gain is about $15,000. If you multiply those two numbers together, it's in the trillions. Our rough guess is the additional productivity added by having 200 million people move from poor countries to rich countries on a rotational basis, which would mostly accrue to the people who move, the workers, is on the order of the economy of France. France is one of the world's largest economies. By allowing this, and it's incremental productivity, it pays for itself. This is why I call it the least you can do. This isn't charity to let someone come work in a nursing home. America needs people working in nursing homes. They'd only get paid the going wage because their productivity in the U.S. justifies it. So the least you could do, could we could generate to the global economy something the size of the, like say, the trillion dollars on the order of the economy, the entire economy of France, and it would go to the people who moved, who, you know, I don't know, depending on how you define poverty, are mostly going to be moderately poor people. So yes, it's it's pretty easy to do back of the envelope calculations, and the gains just dwarf anything anybody's talking about. We'll be back after a short break. Enjoy the most memorable flying experience in the world with Q Suite. Qatar Airways exclusive business class. Experience an unforgettable journey to over 160 destinations worldwide with the seven times winner of the world's best airline as voted by the Skytrax World Airline Awards. Home to one of the most innovative and modern fleets in the world, our spacious and comfortable seating, delectable cuisine, and extensive entertainment options make flying with us a truly remarkable experience. Q Suite is available on select routes from Qatar Airways Business Class. Please check the availability of Q Suite for your flight at the time of booking. Book now at QatarAirways.com. I want to make what is going to seem like a very abrupt shift to any listeners who don't know the essay already, but everyone will soon get what what we're doing here. So let's shift gears and talk about technology. The common view is that automation, um, and especially automation that replaces human labor, is a kind of inexorable organic force driven by technological change. You argue in the piece that that view of technology is wrong, that it's it's much more a choice, much more a response to incentives. Tell us what what is wrong about the, the kind of common common myth of how this happens and what the right way of understanding it is. Well, I think most people sense in America who haven't really looked at the data, is that technology has just happened in the sense that, you know, Moore's law is just some kind of natural process that we've come to understand how to put more and more bits and bytes and information in the same space. And that that leads naturally to automating things with machines that were formerly done by humans. I mean, after all, there's that recent movie about the African-American women who were computers for the NASA program. They called them computers, right? Um, But, you know, the natural change of Moore's law made computing a machine activity and not a human activity. But, and then the assumption is that's mostly caused a loss in low-skilled jobs and gains to high-skilled people because high-skilled people now command. They have the technology augments their skills, but substitutes for low skills. That view is wrong. What's really happened is the labor market in the US and every other OECD country has polarized. The technology has hit the middle of the distribution, but the change in demand for labor and the change in the wages is U-shaped, not linear. 
so at the bottom 20 or 30 percent of the 1970s distribution of occupations by wages, which are, again, these low skill or core skill jobs, those haven't been destroyed by technology. And the reason they haven't been is what technology did is it made things that were routine automatable. But lots of things like taking care of an elderly person, helping an elderly person get out of bed, helping an elderly person get dressed is not a routine function that is easily amenable to algorithms and computing power. So what the real choice we face is, do we attack the bottom half of the U with technology in the way that technology attacked or had negative effects on the middle of the distribution? But the point is, this isn't a natural thing. These jobs that have yet to be automated are not easily automatable, or they would have been automated. You want to point out to people that Moore's law has improved computing power by 10 to the 11th. I like to 10 to the 11th, that's such an imaginably large number. The difference between the speed you drive on the freeway and the speed of light is 10 to the 7th. (laughs) So the difference in computing power is, you know, a thousand times bigger than the difference between your freeway speed and the speed of light. So it's just an unimaginably large number. If that increase in Cuban power hasn't displaced these jobs, it's because they're not really amenable to it, right? And so to some extent, a lot of what's happening now about robots is people are trying to, uh, you know, attack the low end, the jobs that aren't routine, aren't easily amenable to automation with more technological research into how them do them. And there's just no reason to do that. That's a completely false necessity. You know, we say necessity is the mother of invention, but false necessity is the mother of stupid inventions. We're inventing stuff to displace the world's most abundant resource. The world's most abundant resource is core skilled labor. It's all over the world. It just doesn't happen to be able to be in the U.S. because of our laws and policies. And that's inducing people to create what, from a global point of view, are just completely nutty technologies. I think most of us moving through the world, the you know what you see as the wrong view feels intuitive to us, right? You see the self-checkout machines at your grocery store. You see, uh, we hear about self-driving cars, all the you know ChatGPT and the ways that that's going to change labor. But you you know point to a number of examples that you think are examples of you know stupid inventions responding to false necessity. What are how do we how should we understand all this automation that we see around us as a uh, response to false necessity in that way? People respond to the environment they're in. So I I had an earlier blog post, (laughs) why are the richest people in the world destroying jobs in Uganda? Because I had gone to Uganda and they had instituted, the Ugandan airport had adopted, you know, self-pay parking lots. And it was like, (laughs) wait a second, why have we, why where Uganda, where their main problem is providing any kind of remunerative employment to the most of their population, why have we adopted this technology that was developed in places where it was very hard at going wages to attract people to sit in a parking booth and take, whereas when you see what the actual technologies are, I was literally last week in Rwanda and in the Rwandan airport, there was some little robot thing going around. And, you know, here's the, you're just taking the technologies and adopting them. Whereas when I went out into the rural areas of Rwanda, they were mowing the lawn with a piece of bent angle iron. So that's the level of technology that's actually well adapted to their wages. But as you say, it feels natural to us because, you know, if you live exclusively in the United States and look around, you think, oh, yeah, we don't have people to do this. We need, you know, inventing a machine to do it makes, you know, the the Roomba vacuum makes a ton of sense (laughs) if you live in the United States. But you don't think that, wait a second, all kinds of people would be super happy to come to the U.S. and vacuum your house as part of a cleaning service. So we're well, you know, as human beings, we often, we're well adapted to the environment we in and we adapt very consciously to 
the choices we have and the constraints we face. And labor shortages, given the demography of the rich world, are just an increasing element of the environment we're in. So to some extent, robots seem a natural response, but it's radically unnatural from a global point of view. And the other implication of this, or the other cost of this, is that all of the capital and creativity and innovative energy that went into creating that Roomba instead didn't go into something that would have been, you know, truly innovative and more productive. As you put it, again, in the piece, let me just quote this line here, because I think it sums it up nicely. The drive to make machines that perform roles that could easily be fulfilled by people not only waste money, but help keep the poorest poor. We're kind of leading technology in the wrong direction and giving up on the the greatest uh, development tool there is. And again, there's both the fact that you're destroying the jobs in the U.S., but then there's this bleed back to where for a variety of people, once you've invented the technology, and one example I use that once you see it, it's hard to unsee. But if you go back and watch any movie from the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, where people arrive by train, what do you see? Porters, right? You arrive by train and people show up with carts to help you with your luggage because you've got all this luggage. Now I travel to the poorest countries in the world and my suitcases have wheels. There are no porters anymore. And it's not that the wages wouldn't sustain it in a poor country. It's that we're carrying technology with us all the time. And again, it's it's kind of a crazy example, but once you see it, it's like, oh, I, I, you know, because wages went up in the U.S., because there weren't wasn't labor in the U.S. to perform this function anymore, that job disappeared. And then people say, oh, how do we cope with the fact that there aren't porters or porters are expensive? Well, let's let's put wheels on suitcases. But once you put the wheels on suitcases, you know, I haven't hired a porter in twenty years, and. It's not economic. The economics is, if I didn't have wheels, uh, I would super happy have a porter. And so we're also bleeding out those jobs. It, you know, you go, I lived in India for several years. There's automated check-in for airlines in Indian airports. It's like, again, in a country that's struggling to find remunerative employment for all its people, that the idea that airlines have decided to automate check-in, which is a good job, it's an attractive job. It's destroying jobs, again, not economically. This isn't, you know, I'm not a Luddite. <laughs> I'm not against technology. I'm just against technology being driven by false necessity. And, and as you note in the piece and has been debated among economists for some time, productivity, even with all this new technology, it seems like there's more efficient technology all around us. But in fact, productivity in the United States and other rich economies has been depressed, not surging in the last few decades. No, this is, again, if you think of things that basically all economists know, but no non-economists know, <laughs> most non-economists think the pace of productivity has been increasing over time. That's only true in this very narrow array of industries that are amenable to automation through Moore's Law, like things like we're chatting over a computer right now as part of this podcast and like everything about IT. But outside of that sector, economy-wide, productivity growth has been much slower in the last few decades than it was in its peak from 1950s to 1970s. So there's economy-wide, as economists measure total factor productivity, total factor productivity growth has been much lower. And a lot of our social and political problems in the rich world is this slower pace of productivity growth but like say, people think, oh, we're living in the most rapid changing productivity in all the time. It's like, no, no, just it's very common for non-economists to believe that. But no economist believes that. So I, th I think if you're having these debates about migrant labor in the United States or Germany or the UK or South Korea or Japan or any other relatively wealthy economy, there are a few different kinds of objections or sources of skepticism. There are, I think, kind of extreme repellent versions of this, but also somewhat more uh, more sensible ones. And let me um, raise a few of those and have you address them. The first is about native workers. And while it is true that there is a shortage of labor in many of the, what you call the core skill jobs, um, I still think there is a, you know, sense, accurate in many ways, that many low-wage workers in the United States haven't exactly been treated especially well in the last few decades or, or thriving. 
one argument is, look, you'd have plenty of people who'd be happy to be at home healthcare aides if you increase the wages from, you know, $15 an hour to $25 an hour or $30 an hour. There's an argument that bringing in lots more um, migrant labor will further depress wages in industries that have already seen wages go down. How do you think about those kinds of objections? So generally, I think the best evidence is that in a flexible labor market, migrants don't displace native labor because the amount of low-skilled labor demand they create by being part of the economy is roughly equivalent to the labor they do. And so the best kind of natural experiment was the Mariel boat lift in the 1980s, where all of a sudden the population, the core-skilled or low-skilled population of Miami went up by almost 7% overnight. And, and this is because a, a huge number of Cubans uh, were able to leave the island all of a sudden. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, is the difficulty of studying the impact of migration on wages is people move to high wages. So, you know, the, and this is the difficulty of economics is that since we're all tied up in a complex system in which human beings are making conscious choices to go here or there, it's very difficult to parse out the causal effects. So what you kind of want is a natural experiment where people didn't go to Miami because they just wanted to. They they went to Miami because all of a sudden Castro let them, and they went to Miami because it was what <laughs> it was what was across the water. They didn't they didn't have the choice to go to Minneapolis, right? So David Card has done a study which I think has held up very well over time. Just finds zero impact on native employment, and I think part of that is really good news. I don't sometimes people don't believe this that migrants don't displace native workers and some the part of the reason for that is very good news the american worker is actually a very productive and highly skilled individual in a global sense and we always kind of knew that you know in economist jargon substitutes mean i can take one of you and replace it with one of me complements means if there's more one of me your productivity goes up not be displaced. So the more different the incremental migrant is from the native worker, the less likely they're close substitutes. So what's changed is in the 1920s, the incremental migrant was in fact a good substitute for the incremental American, right? And so a lot of the, in the era in which our nativist, very sharply limited immigration policies were established, it probably was the case that incremental migration was bad for native workers. But part of the divergence big time that I mentioned before of the divergence in incomes and skills between the U.S. and other workers, in spite of the convergence in schooling, we can come back to that, is that the typical native, you know, you are not easily substitutable by a core skilled person coming from Haiti. And so the reason why immigrants don't displace native workers is good news. It's good news because mostly American workers have moved up the skills chain. And so who incremental migrants mostly substitute for is previous migrants. The the other objection that you would hear from, you know, most politicians is kind of societal or political one. And some would invoke this out of fear, some out of kind of genuine concern. You cite some research in the piece noting that Based on surveys of people in uh, countries around the world, 158 million additional migrants would want to come to the United States today if given the opportunity, which yeah. is a, yeah. a number that I think if you're, whether you're Joe Biden or you're um, a different kind of politician in the United States, you would find that rather alarming. How do you think about the kind of politics of this? And is there a way, I mean, you, you, you argue that creating a better system, a better structure that would allow what you call rotational migration would in fact help allay some of those concerns. Yeah, I think a lot of the political challenge is that since the 1920s, when, again, migration restrictions were mostly launched around the world in the aftermath of World War I, we've forced two questions to have the same answer. One question is, who is the future citizens? Who's the future of us, right? Who is the future voters and citizens and society of America or Germany or Japan or France. And the second question is, who are we going to allow to be legally present on our physical territory to perform labor services? If you 
force those two questions together, then you're going to be very reluctant to allow workers to come to do jobs, even if you really need them. Because you're going to say, look, we might need more elder care workers, but I'm not going to put the future of the vision of who we are as a people and as a nation and as a society at the beck and call of labor demand. Whereas if you separate those two questions, the whole politics changes, right? You say, look, yeah, you know, I, I, my view about migration, I think, tends to make both ends of the political spectrum unhappy, which I take as a virtue. I'm perfectly happy to say not everyone who doesn't want to put, there is a sense of nation and there is a sense of people and countries have every legitimate reason to protect that. And if the Swiss want to be Swiss and they want to protect their Swissness and Japanese want to be Japanese and they want to protect their Japanese, that's not xenophobia. That's not racism. That's a legitimate human impulse. And we should acknowledge that. But they don't have to if they will say, we're going to have one set of decisions of who the future of us is, and we're going to have one set of decisions about who we're going to allow to be here to work. And those don't have to have the same answer in, you know, and again, in the short and immediate run. I'm not advocating programs that would let the Gulf style where you could work from Bangladesh for 40 years in Kuwait, and when you're done, you're done, and you haven't entitled any engagement with the society. Having permanent workers present in your society without ever being on a path to citizenship, I think is very dangerous. But rotational, we do in fact have all kinds, we acknowledge that all the time. We have all kinds of rotational possibilities. We say, yeah, you know, if people want to come and do this in a short-term way, let's allow them to do it without necessarily endowing that legitimate economic need to conflate with our political need to say, who is, who's the future of us? You raise what I think is another objection to this kind of expanding labor of this kind, and that's less prominent political debates in the United States or other rich countries, but I think comes to mind for most people when they hear about this kind of labor. There's, of course, the the Gulf model where you have lots of South Asian laborers who are kind of living in camps and very isolated and, you know, in some cases are kind of indentured servants in a way that some people call modern slavery. There have been reports in the U.S. of child migrant labor being, you know, exploited by bosses of, of several kinds. I mean, how do you ensure that this kind of expansion doesn't merely result in more of that kind of exploitation? I actually think there's a good case to be made for the opposite effect, which is, you know, I want more and better labor mobility. And I think with respect to labor mobility, particularly in the U.S., but we're exactly in prohibition. <laughs> You know, Americans decided to pass a constitutional amendment that banned all sale and import and production of alcohol. And then they learned they really didn't want to enforce it. <laughs> and so what you did is you made a perfectly natural, you forced a perfectly natural industry underground. And when you forced it underground, you realized you couldn't both have it illegal and regulated. So I think there's gains to be had by saying you know, we are going to have these people and they're going to come and work, but we want to do it in a way that's consistent with our best vision of who we are. And I think the best vision of who we are as an American people, we want, we don't want child workers and we want to enforce that. And we don't want people tricked and defrauded and abused. We want them to be protected, but the way to protect them is to create legal pathways. And so Without the legal pathways, we have forced a huge amount of employment in these industries in the United States off of the books. And by forcing it off the books, it makes it harder to regulate and harder to protect the workers. So as part of the labor mobility partnerships that organization I work with, we want to think about how do you construct an industry that does the functions of moving people back and forth well? You know, how do you recruit people fairly? How do you prepare them for the jobs they're going to do? How do you place them with legitimate workers? How do you protect them while they're in place? And how do you facilitate compliance with return? Those five functions can be carried out, but we have to acknowledge that it's an industry and we have to think of it as an industry of people who move people and we need to regulate it as an industry. I think most of us in the worlds of policy, both domestic and foreign, probably spend much less time thinking about demographic trends and the constraints and challenges of demographics than we should. But we have seen in the last uh, last few months demographic 
constraints leap into headlines in a way that is not all that all that common. We've seen, of course, in China, the the demographic challenges that are going to lead to shrinking populations and a you know really disadvantageous ratio of of, of workers to retirees, which will make uh, sustaining their economy much more challenging. In France, in, in recent days, we've seen enormous protests against. President Macron's efforts to raise the retirement aid from 60 to 64 motivated, I might have the number slightly wrong here, but something like a, a change from four workers for every retiree to, to 1.5 or 1.7 or something like that, which creates huge challenges in sustaining the safety net in the welfare state. Do you see, and, and you could you know, discuss the demographic challenges of the United States and East Asia and kind of any, any developed economy, do you think that the growing awareness of these demographic trends, the uh, just you know constraints they're going to put on economic and political systems might change this debate in the in the years ahead. I'm quite confident that that's going to happen. I have a saying that I go by that isn't always true, but I it, what has to happen will happen. And even 20 years ago, there was a prominent demographer, Paul Demain, who was editor of the Population Development View, a Hungarian, wonderful gentleman. He gave this presentation about the implications of aging in Europe. And he pointed out, and this was 20 years ago, he pointed out there's only three options. Either you increase taxes, you decrease benefits, or you allow a lot more migrants to work and pay taxes to support the current aged. And those are kind of arithmetically the only options. All three of them are completely impossible, but one of them has to happen. So sometimes I think labor mobility is the least impossible of the three impossibles. And if you watch, I would pretty sure, and I don't follow this as a specialist, but going from 62 to 64 is a tiny little fraction of what you would have to do to really address. And France, by the way, is one of the most demographically stable European countries. So de- France is facing, in some sense, less demographic pressures because their fall in fertility happened a very long time ago compared to, say, Eastern Europe or Italy that have had much more rapid falls in demography, facing much more higher pressures. But if you look, you know, you just a hair's breadth to bringing down the government over moving from 62 to 64. <laughs> It's really going to be impossible to cut benefits in the social contract that we've developed and which we all benefit from and all in favor of. You know, taxes around the OECD are at 40 to 45 to 50 percent already. And so, you know, the scope for incremental taxation, you know, tax rates in Europe fundamentally haven't as a percent of GDP haven't gone up in 20 or 30 years because I think they've reached a quite high level. It's hard to tax more than that. So like I say, there's th- one of three things arithmetically has to happen. And of those three, migration might sound politically impossible, but it's if handled well, and if you separate it out from the challenge to we're selling the soul of our nation state in order to meet our labor needs and acknowledge a sophisticated conversation of the different types of ways in which people are allowed to be on our on our sovereign territory, I think it's the least impossible. So, it, <laughs> which isn't to say it's easy, but it is the, the least impossible. That is a good note to end on. Lance, thanks for the wonderful essay and the current issue, and thanks for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs Interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in.